perhaps the most holy day of worship ever. It's the day when all Christians all around the globe gather sometime during this 24 hours to celebrate the holy feast that Christ has prepared for us. Sometime during this day, every Christian around the world will try to find an opportunity to break bread and drink from the vine, to remember Christ, and to remember, to bring together the members of the body of Christ. It's a holy, a very special, and mysterious thing that takes place. And so welcome, welcome to worshiping with the Presbyterians in Belden and Laurel. It's a delight to have you with us. And if you have juice and bread or crackers or whatever you can use for elements for communion, I invite you to bring them to the, your place of worship so that you might share communion with us and with other Christians around the world when we come to that part in our service. I invite you now to join me in the call to worship. From north and south, from east and west, we come. God's people call to the table where simple grace nourishes us. From down the street to across town, from single households to apartment dwellers. God's people are called to community where we live and serve one another. From every class, every race, every status. From little ones with sippy cups to elders with overflowing hearts. God's people are called to witness to God's hope, to offer peace to a shattered world. Let us prepare our hearts by singing, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. When we gather for worship, we come with all kinds of things that distract us and some things that have broken our relationships with one another. And so early in our service, we confess and we lay all that at the feet of Christ. I invite you to join me in the prayer for hope and forgiveness. Lord, as we prepare to break the bread and drink from the cup, we cannot help but hesitate. We remember your admonition to go and be reconciled to our siblings before approaching your table. We recognize how we have fanned the flames of division rather than repair the breach between us. We know we do not make evident our unity in you, our oneness made possible through your sacrifice. 
Too many of your children do not have a place at the table, do not have enough to eat, are relegated to beg for crumbs when you command us to offer radical and abundant hospitality. In your relentless mercy, forgive us, free us from fear, and make us conduits for your reconciling love. Amen. God refuses to give up on us. God restores us. God sent the only Son to save us. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, believe the good news through Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. May the peace of Christ be with you. No cutting in line. You have to follow the rules. Have you ever heard that? Do you know what a rule is? Well, it's a direction that we really have to follow. Some rules are laws. How do we learn about rules? Well, we learn about them from our parents, from our teachers and from other adults, don't we? But this is the hardest question. Why do we have rules? You know, right now we have some special guidelines. They're kind of like rules that are supposed to keep us safe from the coronavirus. We have to wear masks some places. We have to wash our hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. And we have to stay at least six feet away from other people, especially when we're in buildings or inside a store or something like that. Those are rules to keep us safe. But what about sports? There are rules in sports too, aren't there? If there weren't any rules in football, well, one team might send five people out on the field and the other team might send 10 or even more. That wouldn't be fair, would it? What about when mom or dad are driving? What if they drove on the wrong side of the road? Or what if instead of stopping on a red light, they went and didn't wait for a green light. That could cause a bad accident, couldn't it? So mom and dad follow the rules or the laws about driving to be safe. You know, when we we're little kids, we all had to learn to color sometime. And at first, you know, a little child coloring they might make their picture look something like this. Kind of looks scribbled all over, doesn't it? And that's okay. But later on, after some practice, getting a little bit bigger, we can color better. And it looks like this. Kind of staying inside the lines and making it neat, not messy. You know, staying inside the lines when you color, that's kind of a rule, isn't it? And it keeps our papers neat. Well, God knew that people were not perfect. And he knew that we would make mistakes. And so he gave people 10 rules. And Moses, we've heard about Moses before, went up onto Mount Sinai and God gave him two stone tablets with the 10 rules written on them. This is a picture an artist drew of what it might have looked like when Moses was carrying those two stone tablets with the 10 commandments on them. You see, God knew that we, want, we would need some rules and he gave them to us so that we could stay safe and to get along with other people 
And those rules also helped us to honor God. Some of them are rules that say, do something. Some of them are rules that say, do not do something. What are those 10 rules? Well, one is have no other gods but God. Number two says only worship him. Number three is be careful with God's name. Number four says keep the Sabbath day special. Number five says honor your father and mother. Number six says do not murder. Number seven is keep your marriage promises. Number eight is do not steal. Number nine is do not lie. And number 10 is do not covet. Now, I think that's the hardest one to understand. And I also think it's the hardest one to do. What does it mean? Do not covet. Well, when you covet something, it means you've seen something that somebody else has and you want it really, 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 really bad. And God says that's not good. And I find that the hardest commandment to keep. You know, we need those rules though. We need them to keep us safe. Even when we don't like the rules, we need them. Sometimes when I see somebody that's being mean to somebody else, I kind of wish God was standing right there with a whistle <whistles> and that he'd say, be nice to each other. You have to follow the rules. Say a little prayer with me. Dear God, help us to remember that you give us rules to keep us safe and to honor you. Help us to follow those rules, even when they are hard to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I left some packets and they have sheets in your packets. And there's also a craft in your packets. And it contains a piece of construction paper, a piece that has two gray stone tablets, and a sheet that has the Ten Commandments written on it that I just read to you, and the title, God's Rules. Cut out your stone tablets and the rules and glue them onto your construction paper so it looks something like this. Put number one, two, three, four, five on the left side, six, seven, eight, nine, ten on the right side. And I just put the title up at the top in the middle. Now, let's see what's in our treasure, shall we? I have a little bag that has rainbows on it today. And inside the bag, there's a sticker sheet. And on the sticker sheet are written the Ten Commandments, four different copies of it. Maybe you have a special notebook, or maybe you have a special sticker collection somewhere that you'd just like to put those on to remember what the Ten Commandments are. Let's see what else is in our little baggie. Each of you gets a whistle, because the whistle is to help us remember that God gave us rules so that we could get along with each other and we could live happy lives together. I hope you have a wonderful week. Bye-bye. Please pray with me. The prayer for illumination. Your law, O Lord, is perfect. Your commandments are clear and your decrees are sure. You don't leave us in the dark to guess how you want us to live, but you send light. No darkness can overcome it. It lights our way 
and illumines our understanding. Send your spirit now so that we will have ears to hear what you're saying to your church. Amen. The reading from the Hebrew Testament, the Old Testament, is from the uh, book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 4, then verses 7 through 9, and then verses 12 through 20. I think you'll recognize these verses. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. The New Testament reading comes from Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. It immediately follows the reading we had last week. Jesus says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized the slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they traded, treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people that produce, produce the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. If you worshiped with us last week, you may recall that the scripture from Philippians was Paul's instruction to them to have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, didn't regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but took the form of a slave being born in human likeness. Now, 
remember that, hold that thought. When my three sons were in youth club in the Fremont Presbyterian Church, they were a part of um, that, that youth group that was based on one rule. And they learned that one rule that was, everyone is a child of God and no one has the right to treat anyone as if they don't matter. Now think about that a minute. We are all children of God. It seems to me that makes us a lot like Jesus, who had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status. If we're all children of God, then aren't we like Jesus, who, who was a child of God, who was the son of God? Well, Paul told us that Christ is our example to follow. He's shown us how to be a child of God, how, how to treat other children of God like they matter. We call Jesus God because in the words of our book of order, he offered the perfect human response to God. So when we watch Jesus, we know how to live that one rule, how to treat others as children of God, as if they matter. So Jesus is our rule book. But long before Jesus, God had given us a rule book. It's called the Ten Commandments. And when we look at those Ten Commandments and when we look at the life of Jesus, it's all summed up in that one rule. Everyone is a child of God and no one has the right to treat anyone else as if they don't matter. It's all summed up right there. Well, the problem is that we humans tend to put ourselves in the center of the universe instead of remembering that we're all children of God. We're like the two-year-old whose mother was trying to teach him the song, Jesus Loves Me. And the two-year-old kept singing, instead of Jesus Loves Me, 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 me. Our self-centeredness lulls us into thinking and acting like the whole world revolves us around us, or, or at least like it should. There's a TV weatherman from the Today Show who once told a story about himself where he had flown into a small airport and as he got off the small plane, there was a, a crowd that had gathered and they were clapping and they were cheering and so he took a bow. And then as he came up from his bow, he realized that they weren't cheering and clapping for him at all. There was an air show going on. As you might imagine, he was a little humiliated by that. When we put ourselves in the center of the universe, it can be humiliating, it can be embarrassing, just downright embarrassing. Well, not only that, not only can it be embarrassing, too much self-focus can often result in violence against other children of God. In the gospel text for today, the farmhands were so focused on themselves and their desire to keep the fruit of the fields to themselves that they became violent, beating and killing anyone who reminded them that they weren't the owners of the field. They forgot who they were, tenants, sharecroppers, stewards of the field. One of my favorite preachers is Barbara Brown Taylor. And in her sermon on this text, she talks about how we are prone to identify with those tenants, especially if we've ever farmed land that we didn't own. Because if you farm land that isn't your own, then you know you don't get all the profit. You just get a little, a little bit of it. You have to give a lot of it away. And that's especially hard for us Americans who, who have kind of in our DNA this idea that if you work hard enough, you can just make a success and you can buy a piece of land and it's your own. And then you can grow your crops and, and put the food on your table and, and it's your own little piece of land. It's the great American dream. 
Well, today's parable defies that story. If it's to be believed, those aren't the values of God's kingdom. Ownership of the vineyard or of the kingdom is not the issue. It's not for sale and it never will be for sale. The owner isn't looking for buyers. He's looking for tenants who will give him his share of the produce at harvest time, which means that the real issue is stewardship, a word that puts us a little on the defense because it challenges our sense of ownership or, or entitlement. Now we might not recognize ourselves in the violence of those farmers in the gospel story, but we're not so different. We just manage our violence in a more acceptable, legal way. Sometimes all the more violent in its subtlety. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. In Wayne, we have the New Haven Agency. It offers shelter for those whose partner has the sense that they own them, and so they have a right to treat them however they want. According to a fact sheet from the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, domestic violence is willful intimidation. Jim and I have both worked with um, perpetrators and victims, or survivors is a better word, of domestic violence and learned that violence is always about power and control. It's always about um, wanting to be in control and having power over others instead of treating everyone like they matter. Today's gospel story shows us that violence results when a person senses a threat to their power and control or their sense of entitlement. The gospel story isn't just about violent criminal behavior. It's about all of us. Whenever we forget whose we are and who is at the center of life, when we decide to put ourselves at the center of life, then this story is about us. What if instead of focusing on what we're entitled to, we all focused on thinking of the world as the kingdom of God? belonging to God and thinking of all people as children of God whose perfect response to God is seen in Jesus of Nazareth. When we fail to recognize that everything we have is a gift from God, when we begin to view the people and the things around us as things to be possessed and controlled, and we put ourselves at the center of the universe, that's when violence begins. And that's when we begin to distort God's gift. That's when we've broken that first commandment to have no other gods than the one true God. And we see this most clearly on the cross. Human greed for ownership hung the beloved child of the owner on the cross. And that's the source of the title and the graphic for today's message haunting the table. I've always thought of haunting as a kind of spooky Halloweenish thing, and Halloween was never my favorite holiday. But the dictionary definition for haunting is a more positive thing. It says haunting means poignant and evocative, difficult to ignore or forget. Think about that. Jesus is haunting, haunting our table. Jesus is evocative and poignant, difficult to ignore or forget. Another preacher who's preached on this topic, this gospel text says, the ten tenants in the vineyard killed the owner's son, but he wouldn't stay dead. And to di this day, he's still haunting the vineyard, reminding us that we are God's guests. Welcome on this earth and welcome to it so long as we remember whose it is and how it is to be used. Today, especially as we celebrate World Communion, the idea of Christ haunting the table seems appropriate. When we say that Christ haunts the table, we're saying that it's hard to ignore Christ and forget Christ when we come to this feast. I pray that's true for us. And that as we come to this table today, 
with all the other Christians in the world, the haunting presence of the one who meets us here, who has prepared this table for us, changes us. And we leave this table a little bit more like Jesus, the one who offered the perfect human response to God. Amen. to the table of grace. Come to the table of grace. This is God's table. It's not yours or mine. Come to the table. As Presbyterians, this table is open to anyone who will come. So come, share communion, share this meal with us. I invite you to pray with me the communion prayer. May God be with us. God is with us. Let us open our hearts. We open them to God and to one another. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity to remember you in the ordinary things of our lives. When we eat our daily bread, rice, tortilla, or potato, we remember how you shared what you had with your friends, breaking yourself open. When we drink from the fruits of our harvest, we are reminded of how you continually bless us with your teachings. Our chipped and well-used cups overflow. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I invite you to pray with me the prayer Jesus taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was at the table with his disciples as he had been many times. And he took the bread and after blessing it, he broke it. And then he gave it to his disciples saying, this bread is my body broken for you for the forgiveness of sin. Eat it and remember me. And in the same way, he took the cup and after giving thanks, he poured it and he gave it to his disciples saying, drink. This cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sin. Drink it and remember me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. eat and drink as we remember the body of Christ. And now may you go into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Show love to everyone. Love and serve God. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of the all-gracious God, the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. May God be among you and remain with you always.